Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning. Thank you once again for complying with our COVID protocol. Again, I know it is a bit of an inconvenience, but we're doing our best to uh, stop the spread, as they say. Um, I want to thank some folks who showed up yesterday to help with lights again. Um, we got uh, quite a major project going on here. Uh, you may not realize there are over 300 fluorescent tubes in this building. And uh, we're in the process of changing them all out to LEDs, which uh, should realize a pretty considerable uh, energy savings for us. And um, the good news is the work is being done by volunteers. The expertise also provided by volunteers, so I know from the fire company. And so um, all we're paying for are the balls and materials. So um, yeah, it should, uh, when you get a chance to be in the hallways again, You'll notice how much brighter they are, and again, we'll have a considerable uh, energy savings. A couple things going on. Uh, we still have the RMK sub sale going on for the nursery school. Um, I believe Deb will be uh, taking orders for those at the Narthex this morning if you'd like to uh, get some good sandwiches and also support our nursery school. Also, there are a list of some events in the bulletin that are going on at our camps right now. And uh, certainly a good time of the year to get out and enjoy some fall weather. Uh, you might want to do it early if you're going to do it today. Um, but get out and enjoy the weather at the uh, hospitality of our church camps. Are there any other announcements we should be aware of this morning? Let us prepare for worship.
as to be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving grace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory be to God in heaven. Peace to the will of all the earth. Mighty God of all creation. Father of surpassing work, we exalt you, we adore you, we lift high our thanks and praise. Saints and angels bow before you, here on earth our songs be raised. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. reading from the 25th chapter of Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with shades of clouds, the song of the ruthless was still. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines straight clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in reading in unison Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along my pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod is the shadow they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Shortly, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A 
reading from the fourth chapter of Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, I stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Judea and I urge Sintosh to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please stand. Hallelujah, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us. Speak until our hearts are stirred. Hallelujah, Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Find him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, Landon and Marion. How are you this morning? Good to see you again. Well, you guys are really good. You might. Uh, I have to get a gold star sometime for never missing church, huh? Yeah, we still did that. Are you sure you can do it? So we have a story this morning about a wedding banquet. Now, have you ever been to a wedding banquet? A big party at a wedding, wedding reception? No? No? Yes? No? No? You, you might not have been, because you're kind of young. A lot of people don't bring young children to wedding parties and wedding banquets, but maybe you've been to big birthday parties and other celebrations, right? So a big party, a big celebration is always fun. Well, this is one where Jesus tells a story about someone who had a wedding and they had this big party with the wedding. And everyone is invited to be a part of God's party. God told this story. 
the king's son was getting married. So the king planned a big wedding banquet. They were going to have a great party. When everything was ready, he sent his servants to tell his friends to come and have fun. But the people who were invited didn't want to come to the party after all. Hmm. Invited by the king and they wouldn't even go. They said they were too busy. Imagine that. They made all kinds of excuses. The king became very angry. So he sent the servants to invite everyone they could find to come to the party. Soon the party was crowded with laughing and dancing people. Jesus explained that being a part of God's family is like this wedding party. Everyone's invited to come to the party. So that's pretty good to know, isn't it? That when God has something very special planned for us, God has a very special life planned for us. He has a special things planned for us to do, a great life for us to enjoy. And He plans for us to be with Him in a great life after we leave this one. It's great to know that He invites us all, right? I mean, if one of your friends was having a big birthday party, and a lot of people you knew got invited, but you didn't, would you be disappointed? Yeah, probably, right? If a lot of your friends were going to the party and you didn't get an invitation, then if you found out that those who weren't going, or those who weren't invited weren't going, and you could go anyway, that would make you happy, right? Because the person having the party just wants everyone to have a chance to be happy, to be with them and celebrate. And that's what Jesus says in this story about the wedding banquet. God wants us all to be with him, to be happy and to celebrate. So he invites us all to be with him at that, what we call the wedding banquet, this great party with him in heaven. So we get the invitation. I think it's a good idea for us to say yes and to go and be with God at that party because he promises us great things. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you extend us this invitation to your great wedding banquet. We pray that you would help us to accept that invitation, to invite others to come with us, and look forward to joining you in this wonderful life that you have planned for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Grace to you in peace this morning, to God the Father, and the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there's been a concept in our society for a while, something that probably started back sometime during my children's generation. It's a concept that really, quite frankly, bothers me a little. I know some of you will disagree with me when I say what I'm about to say. Some of you may even argue with me or get angry about what I'm about to say. But this concept that bothers me is a sort of threefold idea that everybody plays, everybody gets a trophy, and everybody wins. You know, it's like our kids go out for a sports team. And whenever they get there, everybody plays every game regardless of what skill they have or may not have. And at the end of the season, everybody gets a trophy, regardless of how well the team did or did not do. Or maybe it's time for the school musical. And everybody who wants a role in that musical gets a role, whether they have any talent or even whether they're willing to explore and work on and improve the talent that they have. Because, after all, everybody plays, everybody wins. Now, I do believe that this idea that everybody plays has some validity in some situations. For instance, when our kids are first learning a new skill. I think the idea that everybody plays is a great thing. Otherwise, they might never have the chance to find out if they do have the skill or the talent, or find out if they're really interested enough to stick with the program or not. Or even when the goal is simply to have fun. You know, I play on a senior softball league, which means it's reserved for old guys. I don't know how I got on it, but um, anyhow. In this senior softball league, the team that I 
I'll play on is mostly interested in having fun, which is a good thing for me. Because if we're one of those teams that's more interested in winning games, I'd probably be relegated to Waterboy, unless they didn't have enough players to fill out a team. So this idea of everybody plays, perhaps even everybody wins, can have some validity. When it becomes dangerous is when we begin to believe that that's the way life in general should be. You know, say, we get out of high school, and we believe we should get into whatever college we want to get into. We should be able to go to the college of our choice, regardless of cost or any other entry requirements, because that's the school I want to go to. After all, everybody plays. Or perhaps when we get a job, it should be the job that I want at the pay I desire, because everybody wins. You see, we begin to believe that whatever I want to have or do, I should be allowed to have or do, because everybody plays, Everybody gets a trophy, everybody wins. Now there is a concept in the church that is somewhat similar to this idea of everybody plays, everybody wins. In the church we call it cheap grace. Cheap grace tells us that because we are justified by grace through faith apart from works of the law, which is of course certainly true, but because of that, there's nothing expected of us in return for this gift of grace. God expect, expects no response from us, and especially we should have to make no sacrifices in response to God's gift of salvation by grace through faith. Well, this parable of Matthew's Gospel this morning, the parable that Jesus told to those, to those people who were gathered around him asking questions, throws a real monkey wrench into that idea of cheap grace. See, Matthew tells this parable, I think, as a warning. A warning that not everybody plays, or at least not everybody wins. He talks about a coming judgment. A final time when the king looks over the wedding banquet and says that someone here has not responded properly. Someone tried to sneak in under false pretenses, and I'm throwing them out. You see, that's no cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who spent time in prison during World War II and ended up dying for his faith, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And if you want to understand why there is no such thing as cheap grace, take a look at Bonhoeffer's book. See, this parable that Jesus tells is a parable about a wedding banquet given by a king for his son. Now in the scriptures, when we read about wedding banquets and kings and sons, it's pretty clear that the king is God, the son is Jesus. God is giving a banquet, a feast for his son Jesus, and he would like us all to be present at that banquet. He would like us all to be at that celebration when Christ comes for his bride, the church. We see a lot of that kind of thing in the book of Revelation. We see a lot of that kind of thing throughout Scripture. The king, the son, the wedding feast, it's all pretty clear what Jesus is talking about here. The king sent out an invitation to people. He asked them to come to the wedding banquet, but some just ignore the invitation. Some have no interest in entering God's kingdom, and others simply turn and walk away, thinking they have better things to do. He sends out more invitations until finally the wedding hall is filled. But be careful to notice what kind of people fill the wedding hall, both good and bad alike. He doesn't fill the hall only with good people, but with good and bad alike. But then comes the time of judgment. The time when the king walks in, looks over the crowd, and sees the one who doesn't have the proper wedding robe. He tells that one that he must go into the outer darkness. So what is this wedding robe that we as Christians are supposed to wear? How do we dress properly for the feast of the king? 
when we respond to this invitation to enter the kingdom, when we respond to God's call to sit at the feast, how do we respond? Do we go in wearing our ragged, old, sinful, tattered clothes? Or are we willing to shed those comfortable but tattered clothes, those sinful clothes that we become so comfortable with, that we become so wrapped up in? Are we willing to shed those clothes and put on something new? To put on some clean clothes, clothing of repentance, clothing of a new life, clothing of changed ways. To use an image from Paul, we put on Christ. To clothe ourselves with Christ. The clean clothes of the Christian life, wedding robe of repentance, are our response to God's invitation to enter his kingdom. Now there's another concept, or I should say misconception in the church, that is just as dangerous, if not more so, than the idea of cheap grace. And that is the idea of works righteousness. There's sort of two ends of the spectrum. You see, when we begin to talk about how there is a cost of discipleship, we're in danger of falling into that trap of works righteousness. See, works righteousness says that we get into the banquet because of all the great things that we have done. Because we are such good people. Because we do nice things. That's how we get into the wedding banquet. That's how we get into the kingdom of heaven. By doing good works. Well, you know that that's not how it works either. When the king sends the servants out to invite the people into the banquet, he doesn't say, only invite the ones who did good things. He says, invite everyone. It's God's grace that gets us that invitation into the kingdom. And it's the wedding robe that we put on is how we respond to that gift of grace. We don't respond in order to get God's favor. We respond out of gratefulness, out of thankfulness, out of joy. That God invites us to come into his kingdom in the first place. Now Matthew recalls this parable to say that it's time to sit down and look at ourselves. You see, this is the third in a series of three parables that Matthew recalls about the people who rejected Jesus. The first two were aimed at the Pharisees and the chief priests. This one is aimed at the people who have said yes to Christ's invitation. This one is aimed at the ones who say, okay, we're sitting at the banquet, we've been invited to the feast, we've responded, we came in. Matthew says, now, take a look at what you're wearing. Now, as the church, as the insiders, the ones who have responded to that invitation, have we put on the wedding robe of repentance? Have we put on the clean clothes of a new Christian life? Or do we continue to wear the same old sinful outfit, thinking that just because we've been invited, just because we call ourselves Christians, everything's okay, and we've made it into that cake of feast? It's not easy to talk about these lessons of judgment. As a pastor, I would love to stand up here and tell you that the Bible says everybody plays, everybody wins. You're all in, and you folks get seats at the head of the table because you are in church on Sunday. But that's not what the Bible says. There are those places that talk about this coming judgment. The time when the king looks over the crowd, and I guess that it didn't bother Jesus to tell those stories. If it didn't bother Matthew and the other gospel writers to tell those stories, I guess there's a call for me to tell those stories too. You know, there is one more very important point to this story. And that is that it is the king who makes the final judgment. The servants have no say over who comes in. The servants are told to invite everyone. It's the king who will decide. It's not up to you or me who knows who gets into the kingdom or who stays in the kingdom. You and I are the ones who are sent out to invite everybody. We extend the invitation. We tell the story of Jesus 
Christ, we invite them to the banquet, both good and bad alike. Amen. Gracious hosts, 
when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community, including the Bethesda Mission, Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, Nutripacks, and the volunteers that make them work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Each one of you is a part of the body of Christ, and you were chosen to live together in peace. So let the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts and be grateful. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Please be
Father in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Please be seated. 